Okay, we ready to go? Welcome back. Uh, glad to rest you out of the clutches of the Red Sox for an hour or so. We'll, we'll return you before the fourth inning is over, I'm betting. Um, I, a couple of announcements as we begin. First, just as a matter of information for me, since we've reached this point in the term, I just want to make sure that everyone who's in the room is registered for the course in one status or another. Is there anyone who is not registered for the course? I'm in the process. You're in the process, okay. We think you're very appealing, okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so, but, but, but you're, you're with us in spirit and soon to be with us. Okay, cool. Anybody else who is in some, some medial stage of transformation, okay. And for all of you at home, uh, for the distance students as well, uh, welcome and we hope that you are also fully registered for the course. This is the point at which the lectures went online are only available to those of you who are registered for the course. Um, and it's also the point, as some of you have uh, made it clear that you know, uh, when we're thinking about the first paper. And so we have a very clear and direct and we hope reassuring message to you about the first paper. Uh, it's, I'm going to say something about it in a second, but it is designed so as to give you practice in close reading and in pulling things out of the text. Uh, it should be something that you are comfortable doing, that you will learn by doing, and we, we know that we are moving relatively quickly through a lot of very ample, magnificent, and difficult plays, and we very much want you to be able to stay with us in the reading process so that we have, hello, uh, we have uh, tried to think about a kind of exam that will be something you can do in, uh, or kind of paper, I'm sorry, kind of paper that you can do in a, in a, uh, w with a lot of attention, getting a lot out of it, uh, and to do well with it, but also so that you can come back to your reading for the week and not lose a week in your reading. So the, uh, there will be pre-selected passages, uh, and this will be largely a close reading paper, uh, and there will be a choice of passages of which you are to choose one and do uh, a, an intensive reading of it. There will be guiding information with the examination, with the, I'm sorry, with the, with the paper materials to uh, show you the kinds of things that we would like you to address. Uh, and again, we're hoping, it, we've tried to build into the course this term, some close reading moments in every lecture. Uh, we'll do some again toward the end of today. Uh, we hope to model these close readings for you in this way, but it's, the idea is not to read like me, but to read like you. Uh, for you to dig into the text and see what it says and what it does and how it relates to the larger play of which it's a part. So there will be quite explicit directions and instructions and guidance, uh, and those things will be coming to you very soon. Is that right? By the, By the beginning of next week. Right, and next week is a holiday. Uh, it's Columbus Day. Go away, enjoy yourselves, don't worry about it. The paper materials will be waiting for you when you return. Uh, and, and then we will be here, and anything that's not clear about them, we'll be able to try to address in person as well, okay? Um, any, any, any anxieties that you want to vocalize as we stand up with our, our um, microphones at the ready? Okay, uh, measure for measure. Um, this is really an extraordinary play. Uh, it is the first Jacobean play that we're looking at, the first play that is written during the kind time of King James. Uh, I want to say some framing things about the readings of plays altogether, and then I want to say something about ways of reading this play as we come to zero in on it. Uh, remember that all plays uh, exist in a number of different time contexts at once. Uh, it, the time and place of its writing, so in this case, uh, written by Shakespeare in early 17th century England, uh, performed in London. The time and place of its fictive setting, where is it set? Vienna. Vienna. So 
uh, and not, not Freud's Vienna, or maybe yes, Freud's Vienna, but in any case, Vienna here as the seat of the Holy Roman Empire, as a, a, a major European city, as a city that is and is not the same place as Shakespeare's London. Uh, uh, so that's the second time and place of its setting. And the third time and place of its setting is right here, right now the place in which it is being performed or read or discussed, that there is always, you, you cannot, and this is a good thing, completely escape your 21st century selves uh, or your location, uh, or in the case of a production, the particular conditions of the production. Uh, and those things, too, become part of the play. If they are anachronistic, uh, the play will run to catch up with them because the play always does exist in the present time as well as in the past. It always exists in the past as well as in the present, that we, we, we can neither wish away anything about the history and culture, nor can we put ourselves in a time machine and whisk ourselves back to that history and culture. There will always be this interplay of now and then and of a multiplicity of places, and every character, therefore, will be resonant of lots of different things, and every, I mean, here's a speech, or a play, I'm sorry, about uh, uh, extramarital sex, about premarital sex. We may think, well, how backward of them to have had such, such strict rules about this, uh, that depending upon your own chronological insertion into this structure, you may remember days when it, there seemed to be this degree of punitive behavior about, about premarital sex, but maybe it's not about premarital sex at all. Maybe it's about something very different. In any case, the idea that there are laws of Vienna and that the laws have been allowed to be unenforced so that somebody quite strict has to be called in in order to enforce them and that people get caught in these laws that are on the books that are, are, are not connected in any way to any understanding of humanity. Uh, this is not an unfamiliar condition in the 21st century either. So that there, there, are, there are big framed things that we can talk about that carry over as well as highly specific things about the play that we want to localize. Uh, this is a play uh, that has been interpreted in a wide range of ways. And I thought I would begin today by just marking out for you a number of different ways that the play has been read. I'm not going to give you full interpretations, but sort of the 30-second version of interpretations, just to give you a sense of how rich these plays are and of how important critical reading is and how, how, how many different ways of good critical readings there can be. And this, this play is particularly susceptible to this. You'll see that we can also say the same about Othello, or about King Lear, about Antony and Cleopatra. But this play is a puzzle in every possible way. And so it has been read in a wide range of ways. And I want you to bear in mind that none of these ways are right or wrong. Some are more persuasive than others to one or another of us. Uh, they all are readings that are um, interested readings, and I mean that in a strong sense. That is to say that they have a kind of purpose to them. Uh, so one kind of, how many of you have ever read this play before, studied it in school? Uh, if you studied it in school years and years and years ago, uh, you might have encountered uh, and I, when I situate the play in this way, I don't want you to say, ah, this is the old-fashioned one, nobody believes this anymore. Uh, but but a, a, a very uh, familiar way of reading this play in the middle of the last century was to read it as a kind of metadrama, as a meta-theatrical -the play. That the, the Duke was like a playwright. He was behind, unseen, he gave people their lines, he set up scenes, he brought characters together, he waited to see what would happen. He got people to lie. He got people to behave against their own character. Um, uh, as you can see, that, that, that what would be some of the, uh, the, the plays that this Duke would set up? Do you guys mind participating in, in this? So, so uh, by participating, I mean that they're going to bring you the microphone. Um, what would be some of the little scenarios that this Duke as playwright sets up? Wait, you have to wait for the microphone. Sorry. When Isabella, uh, I guess, speaks with the friar and they're going to get Mariana 
seduce the, the, yes, so, so the whole the bed trick, the substitution yeah. of the one woman for the other woman in Angelo's bed. This is his idea. He gets both women to participate in this plan. Uh, that's certainly one scenario. What else? Over here? The unmasking scene at the end of the play, when all the characters are brought together in, in, in disguise of, of some of them in disguises and the Duke on, on reveals. Yes, he's, he are. has yeah. staged this whole thing. He's got Claudio muffled off stage. He's got Mariana in her veil. He sets the whole, up the whole entry into the city. They all say, well, why is it that there has to be an audience and that there has to be a, 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 a processional and we have to present our authorities back to the, to the, uh, to, to the Duke? Well, he's set this thing, whole thing up as a revelation, as a set of unmaskings. One last one back there, sir. I think in the beginning of the play, the deputization of Angelo, uh, the Duke kind of abdicates his power, gives his power to Angelo. And say a little bit why you think that that is the act of a playwright. Well, he has a choice to do that. Um, Aeschylus does. I mean, he could give the job to somebody else, I guess. Um, He's directing the action. Well, it's, it's the, now Aeschylus is the old counselor, of course. Aeschylus is the wise old, old, mm. you know, uh, steady person here. We have three people. We have the Duke, Duke Vincentio. We have Aeschylus, the old counselor, and we have Bless Angelo, you. the young deputy. And so the conversation is between the Duke and Aeschylus. There's almost always this kind of character in these Shakespeare, early Shakespearean moments. Some, some old reliable counselor who, who stands for the old way of thinking about things. In Richard II, it's, it's, it's his uncle, the Duke of York. Uh, we'll see in, in Pericles, there's such a figure that in, in King Lear, it's Kent. Uh, there's always some kind of figure of rectitude and often of, of age. Uh, we could argue that it's Nestor in the play that we looked at last week in Troilus and Cressida, but since Troilus and Cressida is a play in which nothing turned out to be grounded, there are no beliefs that actually hold, uh, the, the old counselor function doesn't really function. But yes, so here, his, his abdication, his apparent abdication of power at the beginning of the play, where you think, well, this is very odd. The play begins with, by a character departing from the play, uh, turns out to be a ruse turns out to be the way that he stops being an actor and starts being a playwright so that he can come back and be an actor and a hero at the end. And of course, he gets caught up in more actions than he thought he would since he becomes involved in a love plot, despite the fact that he has said that the dripping dart of love has never touched his bosom. So, so, so the, 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 this metatheatrical reading of the play that the Duke is like a playwright, that the play is about uh, acting a play. Now again, remember the play is written about the same time as Hamlet, it's just a little bit after Hamlet, that plays within the play always appear in Shakespeare, uh, and that this question of, of whether you are in a safe space with respect to the play that you've set up, or whether the play is gonna pull you into the action and either unmask you or make you perform within it, this is always the case with it, plays within the play. Uh, but, but here, the, what, what is called by Lucio at one point, the old fantastical Duke of Dark Corners, the, dark, uh, the Duke who likes to remove himself from the gaze of the people, uh, that this, the fact that he is behind the scenes, in disguise, as the friar, uh, means that he can be the, the actor in the audience at once, he can be the playwright manipulating people. Of course, not everything manipulates itself to his command. What would be an example of something in which the playwright cannot manage the play? Is it uh, Berner Bernardine? It is. Is that how you pronounce it? It Where, is. Barnardine, yes. Barnardine, when right. you can't um, force him to reconcile with God before he goes. He won't die. Executed. This guy's got to <laughs> die. The plan is, is the exchange of the head of one prisoner for the head of the, another prisoner. Well, they look very differently. Don't worry about it. Death's a great disguiser. This is a great plan. Uh, the problem is that the, the, one of the actors revolts and he will not play this play. I will not die today. I will not consent to die today at any man's persuasion. So he's completely obdurate. He stands apart from the play. And lo and behold, what happens instead? Some kind of deus ex machina. Someone else turns out to have already died, who looks much more like Claudio. The head would, would be a much better substitute. But more to the point, this character, whom we really quite get 
to like. He's my favorite character in the play, I think, um, is because he's the, he's the ground of resistance. He is the thing itself. He, and that we're going to see, we saw in, in uh, Troilus and Cressida, what character or characters could be described as sort of the thing itself, the unvarnished, uh, life-loving, non-rule-obeying people. Who, do you remember Troilus and Cressida? Only last week? Thersites, okay. So all the, all the argument is a whore and a cuckold. Let's not dress it up in fancy language. Uh, I'm going to tell it like it is, etc. So in this play, it's Barnardine. I'm not going to die. Uh, and so the, you have instead the, the, the head ex machina, the prisoner ex machina, Ragozin. Uh, but but this, this is a, a harbinger. I mean, I think that when I say it, it's deliberate, it's all deliberate. But it's the, it, it, it seems important to the effect of the play that the Duke himself not be all-powerful, that the playwright uh, encounter some resistances to the seamless running of the play. And there are other ones, of which I would say his falling in love with Isabella, if he does, is another interruption in the, in the element of control. That he, because, and we'll come in a second to the question of whether she reciprocates his love or not. So, so meta-theater, this is one, Duke as playwright. Uh, the, there is, of course, a very course. There is a strong historicist reading of this play, uh, which says, well, Duke may be a playwright, but he's also uh, looks very much like the king who actually happens to be on the throne, James I, uh, a Protestant, a figure with strong views about moral rectitude, not his own, but everybody else's anyway, and. and uh, a, a figure who very explicitly doesn't like to expose himself to the people, that fam famous passage in the play, they're all famous, but the passage in the play in which he says that I don't like to show myself to the people and to their aves vehement, to their, their vehement hailing. Uh, the, I like to, to, he likes to remove himself. Uh, this is, was, was said very much to be the case with James, that he liked to sort of be the looker on, that he liked to watch from the sides and so forth that uh, he was interested in this kind of social reform or social change, uh, and that the, the re-entry into the city at the end in which the, the, the deputies, the substitutes, give back their authorities to the king is very much like a royal progress of the king coming into London, uh, that uh, many people said, you know, aha, the Duke is James I. This is really a story about James's power and how different James's power is from the erotic and flirtatious and equally powerful but differently distant kind of power that Elizabeth held over her subjects and that was theatricalized in seductive figures, uh, seductive female figures who controlled by, by, by being beautiful and by being courted and so forth. Uh, here we have a Shakespearean comedy, if it is a comedy, uh, in which instead of going into a green world or a world of transformation, as happens in As You Like It when Rosalind goes into the green world, uh, or even in uh, The Merchant of Venice, in which Portia, a figure I think is very much like a kind of idealized figure for Queen Elizabeth, uh, reigns in Belmont, a place you know, probably that you know, doesn't value money. It's got gold, but the gold is all decorative and beautiful and so forth. It's full of music. Uh, this is a play in which the inner world, uh, and there is an inner world, is an inner world that is revealed by unmasking and then by remasking. Uh, what is revealed is the corruption in Vienna. The whorehouses, the... the, the, uh, the, the inner life of Angelo, his capacity to be, because he is so immoderate, because his, his rectitude is so immoderate, so also is his lust immoderate. It's, it is, they're, they're two sides of the same thing, and one could make the same argument about Isabella, that her purity, require, desiring a more, re, more strict restraint in the order of the Clares, they, they, uh, she wants to know what the, what the game is about or what the rules are about the, the, the poor Clares, this extremely abstemious order, which is a begging order of, of nuns, of sisters. Uh, and she wants to know what are the limits here. And uh, they, they say, well, you know, is it that you feel too constrained? No, no, desiring a more strict restraint, that she's immoderate in her, as, as Angelo is, 
in, in their refusal of sense of sensuousness of desire and even in their their uh, toleration of human frailty the I mean all these things that, that Isabella says to Angelo and various other people do as well if you had been as him if you'd been in Claudio's situation if you'd been in love and had slipped in this way and were in love with the woman with whom you had sex and who's bearing your child surely you would not have been so stern uh, and you wouldn't want your judge to be so stern. Uh, but this, so this, this, this notion of, uh, of, of hyper-rectitude here as, as uh, being itself the enemy of, of human feeling and of human grace and human mercy. Uh, some of these things were also attributed, hypothetically at least, to James. Um, in any case, the, the, the idea that this play was a... Um, an imagined version of James controlling his social world and trying to reform his social world had a lot of traction for quite a long time, and there are quite similar th things that are similar in this character uh, to the character of James. I, you probably know if you look, re looked at any of the prefatory material uh, in your book that there are several sources to this play, that there's classical sources and that there are Italian sources and so forth. There are lots of different versions of this story. So it's not only about James, it's about these previous examples, Whetstone's Promise and Cassandra and various other things. Uh, but there, there's been a strong argument that, aha, the right way to read this or a revealing way to read this is read this as a kind of allegory about James's relationship to London to kingship to rule to the question of the king on a stage the word that he himself would use uh, and whether princes which is the common word here for kings and queens uh, like to show themselves to the people or not or whether they are more powerful if they're behind the scenes. So you may say that this is an argument very like the meta theatrical argument but it's an argument based upon history. Uh, there have been very powerful feminist readings of this play. Uh, readings that, that talk about uh, Isabella's agency, the degree to which she is, and, Mar and, and Mariana's agency, and Julietta's agency. By agency, I mean their capacity to be actors. The agent, the opposite of agent is patient. That is, someone to whom something is done. Uh, and the, the, uh, so the, and the opposite also of agency is pathos, is suffering, is uh, uh, being a passive sufferer here. Uh, so a, bi a big word for political criticism in the last you know, 50, 60 years has been this notion of agency, of whether you are in control of your own destiny, your own desires, your own future, and so forth. And to look at these three women, Mariana, whose backstory we get, uh, her Mar look at Mariana's entire situation. She's entirely obligated to men and what they do. Her brother had her dowry in his ship. His ship was sunk. With it went the dowry, the protection of the brother, and the marriage. Uh, Angelo, to whom she was betrothed, and again, we get this as a story. We get this as a story. We own, the only corroborating evidence we get is from her and a little bit from Angelo when he repents at the very end of the play. Uh, she was engaged to Angelo. Angelo uh, disavowed the engagement, uh, stepped aside from it, and left her in an impossible position, exiled out of the play space. Mariana in the moated grange, a phrase that Tennyson would pick up and write a beautiful poem on this topic, uh, moted, that is to say, it, moted like walled, separated away, away from the world. Again, an image that walled garden, of course, we, we, you see in Romeo and Juliet, you see in the Paradise Lost, you see uh, in, in many places. Walled garden is an image of paradise and an image of virginity. The, 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 old, the, the uh, unicorn tapestries that show the virgin inside the fence. The fence is the sign of her virginity, of her enclosedness, of her perfectedness, of the fact that she has not been invaded. Uh, so Mariana is in a kind of uh, sad, autumnal version of this uh, enclosed garden. 
if you know the Song of Songs uh, in the Bible, a garden shut up is my sister, my spouse. That, that's partly where this image comes from, the idea that, that the, the virginal woman, the beloved woman, uh, is, is, is pure, is like a garden, is uninvaded. She is the Garden of Eden. She's not only in the Garden of Eden, she is the Garden of Eden. So here we have uh, something I need to do, Mill. Okay, sorry. Uh, the, so here we have Mariani in the moated grange, where uh, a grange is a farmhouse, and the moat surrounds it, and she is off stage, out of the playing space, and stuck in this sort of anti-Edenic Eden, in which she's stuck with her own virginity. She's stuck in that moment of wanting to be a wife but not being one, uh, and she has no agency at all. She needs to be uh, rescued here by the wise duke uh, in his capacity as the wise friar. Any reader of Romeo and Juliet should be a little cautious about wise friars and what they're going to do with women in desperate situations because they always overstep. Uh, think about this in connection with Friar Lawrence in Romeo and Juliet, who when Juliet is in extremis, Romeo has been banished and so forth, her, her cousin Tybalt has been killed, decides that he's going to give her this magical potion that's going to simulate death. Uh, and he's going to then bring her back to life and restore her to Romeo. Doesn't quite work out that way, that this friar takes upon him the power of life and death, and what they get is death in the play, though you may say life in the memory of both those left on stage and those who watch the play. So here we have a friar who's not a friar, uh, who ha has more control and less control, uh, who also imagines himself as rescuing a maiden in distress and who sets up the bed trick. This is an you know, old, old folkloric inheritance, this idea of the, uh, the, the substitute in the bed. Uh, it's the, the, this play has a bed trick and a head trick in it. Both of them are, are, are substitutions. And I'll talk about the relation between them in a second when we come to a very different category, the category of Freudian interpretation. But let's hold that thought over here uh, and just stick with the fact that, the, that, that, that Mariana is arguably in the play the, 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 the woman with the least agency. Um, that here, here I should say something that is historical and feminist at the same time, and that is to let you know if you haven't read your footnotes carefully, that marriage ceremonies were in a way speech acts in this period. Uh, they're called spousals, and there are at least two different kinds of spousals, espousals, that is to say, a wed an act of wedding. One was the, the spousal uh, de presenti in the present, I take you to be my wedded husband or my wedded wife, and one was the spousal in futuro, I will take you to be my wedded spouse if certain conditions are met. Now, in the case of Mariana, again, what were the conditions? The dowry. The dowry is the principal condition that is not met. And we also, of course, had, had an unwilling husband uh, as a result of that. But so this is a, this is a promise that is not fulfilled. Uh, one way, one, one very vivid way of, of having a marriage de presenti in the present was not only to use the present tense, I take you, rather than I will take you, but also to have consummate the marriage, to have sex. Uh, and this is clearly what has happened with Juliet and Claudio. Julietta and Claudio, notice it's the same name. Uh, that they have had sex, that they have embraced, that, they, that she is pregnant. Uh, we have several different descriptions of her pregnancy. One of them says, uh, as, as, as those that feed grow full, as spring turns into summer. It's a very beautiful passage. Uh, another one says the, the, the sign of their sin is written gross on Juliet, a very different description of, uh, and again, it's these two sides of the, or looking through the two ends of the telescope. Uh, in, uh, in any case, the, 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 the consummation is itself an act, a speech act, or a performance act that, that moves from the future into the present. And that's basically what the Duke as friar sets up for Mariano, Mariana and Angelo uh, at, at, in this, this assignation in which there's the substitution. That he had been promised to her, 
he now has sex with the woman with whom he was promised, or to whom he was promised, and this, uh, rather than being extramarital sex, is in fact the fulfillment of the contract. Um, and so at least this is how he explains it and how he rationalizes it. Uh, then we have, so we have Juliet, who is the sexually fully engaged woman, who, however, you may notice, has relatively few lines in the play. And I think no lines in the last act. Um, in, in any case, she, somebody can prove me wrong. I'd like to be proven wrong on this. Uh, she, uh, uh, the, the, the story of Claudio and Giulietta is the, is the cause for much that happens here, because this is, of course, the rule that, that Angelo is going to enforce this rule against premarital sex, and they can't pretend they haven't had it because she's pregnant. Uh, but, and that's what leads to, well, because otherwise we have, it's just, he said, he said. Uh, the, the, the evidence of this is in, in, the, in the child. Uh, and, and so the body speaks here. When, when it said it, it's written gross on Juliet, that is the testimony. That is the testimony that testifies against her, that her body testifies both for her and against her. Uh, so Juliet, you might say, is the most empowered woman in one sense because she is the most sexually active and the most uh, love affirmative woman in the play, uh, and she makes a choice. Uh, and what's gone wrong, in fact, with this marriage? Why isn't it a marriage? Sorry. What's the dowry problem? It's. Anybody remember more about the? Anybody? That was Mariana's dowry went down when went, went down with ship. What happened here? Yes. They're hoping the family will come to like him more. That more money is needed, that's right, and it hasn't yet been, been produced. So we haven't, haven't quite come up with this, again, money for love. I mean, and, and please notice that on the other side of this whole equation of all these well-born women and whether they should have sex or not, whether they get caught or not, is Mistress Overdone, is Pompey the Bawd, is all these women who are taking money for sex. How is this different from taking money for sex in a dowry situation? This is the story of Shaw's play, Mrs. Warren's Profession about the relationship between marriage and running a whorehouse. It's just a matter of social station. So also here, the entire range of women, sex, money is in play in this play. Uh, Isabella is the central female character, we could say, of this play. And she begins as a novice in a nunnery, somebody who has said no to what Juliet says yes to. She's choosing another path. Uh, notice that the, the, not only that she wants a more strict restraint, and there's that, that amazing passage uh, when, when uh, Claudio asks her, please, to have sex with Angelo so as to save him. Uh, Were I under the pain of death, the impression of keen whips I'd wear as rubies, and Something myself to, to death as to a bed that longing had been sick for ere I'd give my, yield my body up to shame. So this extraordinary kind of S&M passage in which she talks about how much, much more she'd rather be beaten and wear the signs of her beating as rubies, as jewels, rather than give her body up to shame. So the, you know, her imagination and her rhetorical imagination ha is, is far more sexual and transgressive than the rules that she thinks that she is herself obeying. Uh, but she begins in the nunnery with this, this strict restraint, desiring more strict restraint. Uh, she herself, remember, is a novitiate. She's half, a, or a novice, I should say, half in and half out, because the rule of the nunnery, what's the rule of the nunnery about talking to men, about encounters with men? Anybody? Wait, you have to, somebody has to wait for the, come guys. You, you can't look at them and talk at the same time. It's either one or the other. Right. You can either look yeah. at them or speak to them. Uh, and the changes are rung on this several times. 
uh, for example, in the end of the play, with the muffling and the unmuffling, and the you know you can't see who they are, uh, but you can hear them, or you can't hear who they are, but you can see them because there are at least three disguised characters at the end of the play. There's there's uh, Mariana in her veil. There's the muffled Claudio, muffled and silent, as if he's a kind of living figure of death at the end of the play. And of course, there's the disguised Duke as well in his hood. And this question of what you can see and what you can hear uh, is, and of course, in, in the uh, in the off stage love scene or whatever it is, the consummation scene between Angelo and Mariana, uh, she has very explicit instructions from the Duke about what she can say and what she can't say. She can't say her name. Uh, she's supposed to just make appropriate noises of some kind. Uh, it's, it's a very funny little set of instructions that he gives her. But in any case, this business about Isabella's uh, uh, being out of the world and coming back into the world begins with this half instruction about you can either look at them and, 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 and not speak or if you're in the nunnery or else you can speak but not look. So she receives this, this, this message and, and is pulled out of the nunnery and into the world. And then she's at the very heart of the play uh, and she and Angelo are both extraordinarily kind of psychosexual figures, and I'll say more about that under another heading in a minute. Uh, but but uh, as with The Taming of the Shrew, uh, so also with this play, uh, feminist readings of this play have been quite unwilling to presume that the heroine, this feisty, outspoken heroine who speaks truth to power, is so willing to uh, make herself a, a dependent upon a powerful man. The Taming of the Shrew, if you know it, uh, many, many people said, Catherine can't possibly really want to yield to Petruchio. She must be winking at the audience. She must be pretending to say yes. In this case, uh, there were, and I've written about this, some, some extraordinary productions of the play in which uh, the, rather, you notice that Isabella never actually says yes to the proposal of the Duke. He proposes twice. I have something to say to you if you'd like to listen to me. Again, look at me and listen to me. Well, no, but she's off doing something else. And again, I have a pro proposal if you will this way incline. In the last scene, he proposes to her twice and she never says yes. Uh, she doesn't say no either. She doesn't say anything to him about this. And his, his second proposal to her says, so let's walk off and we'll talk about this. That gesture that you say, see at the end of just about every Shakespearean play, whether it's a comedy or a tragedy or a history, the idea that more conversation will take place in another place. In comedies in particular, which are, are, are less deeply fraught, people are not in mourning, they're not coping with, with major losses, there's this kind of ambling off together and chatting by the way. Uh, but an unresolved matter, at least in terms of lines of the play, is the question of Isabella's marriage to the Duke. Now, it's a comedy. It's supposed to end in marriage, right? So we've got the marriage, the supposed marriage of Angelo and uh, Mariana. Uh, what other marriages do we have? Yes? Lucio and Kate Keepdown. Yes, indeed. Kate Keepdown, as you can tell from her name, is a, 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 a late inhabitant of the whorehouse. Uh, he, uh, he, Lucio is one of these uh, uh, prating wise guy characters that you also find. Who, who is the version of this in Troilus and Cressida? Yeah. Cressida. Cressida is like Lucio? All right, no, indeed, indeed, Cressida is very like Kate. I mean, it's, uh, you would hate to say that, that Cressida is just like a piece of uh, the traffic in women, a piece of woman exchanged for uh, between men. But that's exactly what the shape of the play is. So here also, it's not, neither Kate nor Lucio who initiate this exchange. It's the Duke who says, uh, you annoy me and you're going to marry this woman, uh, and that's going to shut you up for good. Um, and he, I mean, he is annoying, but he's annoying in that very familiar way that, that, that there's almost always that Gracciano in, in Merchant of Venice is like this. Thersites is a little bit like this as his pander in, in, in Troilus and Cressida. Uh, they're, they're, uh, they're, uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are like this in Hamlet. They're characters like this in just about every play. Uh, but yes, there's the marriage of, of Lucio and Kate Keepdown. Here we, I 
do you mind that I keep talking about the whole range of Shakespearean plays in one in one gulp? I can't help thinking this way. Uh, and uh, in a, a slightly earlier comedy, As You Like It, there are also four marriages, and they range from the highly idealized to the extremely body and you know unidealized. And so here too, we have uh, you know on the one hand young love and or whatever it is, idealized love and unconsummated love. On the other, on the other hand, we have first consummation and afterward the notion of marriage. And then of course there's Juliet and Claudio. Uh, and so the Duke and uh, Isabella, these major characters, they surely they've got to get together in order to march off together. They should all go arm in arm. Uh, all the pairs should be together. It's what a comedy is. But she doesn't say yes. And there re really were productions there were productions in which she said no, and there were productions or in which she looked very indifferent and uninterested, she didn't say anything. Uh, and there, I didn't remember whether I wrote about this in my chapter or not, but there's, there was a famous production in which she took off her wimple and shook her hair out and became an independent woman. And uh, it was quite unclear uh, that she was eager to enlist herself in another strict restraint that the idea was that the nunnery and marriage were not so different from one another, and that what had happened to Isabella was a kind of liberation. Uh, Isabella, incidentally, is the same name as Elizabeth. Um, that Isabella, it's the, the Spanish-Italian form of Elizabeth. Uh, that here is a woman who might not be choosing marriage at the end of this play. We, it's undecided. It may be undecidable, but it's certainly undecided at the end of the play. So, so feminist readings of this play would include a kind of materialist feminism that was interested in this business of spousals and how they worked, bringing, that is to say, the female characters into strong view, not thinking this, of this as a play in which the Duke and Angelo are the key figures and the women are just pawns trying to act out the power struggle between these two men and these two types. Uh, but also feminist readings in which resistance uh, was freedom and coming into language away from the silence of the nunnery into the speech, into the prone speech of Isabel as it's described. She's required to plead for her brother. She's then required to plead for Mariana, remember? She, uh, uh, she, she first, the Duke wants her to lie and to say that she slept with Angelo. He defiled me in order to get him to, to you know, feel that the, he has actually done this thing. Um, and then when, the, if you'll remember the end of the play, uh, Angelo, having apparently been convicted, uh, agrees to marry um, Mariana. And the Duke says, fine, first you're going to get married, and then you going to be killed because you still did this bad thing against the rules that you yourself were enforcing. And she, Mariana, asks Isabella to plead with her for not to make this a travesty, not to make this a mockery, to uh, plead with her to allow Angelo to be pardoned so that the marriage can continue. And so Isabella becomes, like Portia, a kind of lawyer, a kind of arguer on behalf of people, very eloquent, and not necessarily, and she says in both of these cases, uh, I'm not necessarily saying what I think. I'm saying what I think is right here. Uh, they, and in the case of Mariana, she, she moves from law to grace. She moves from, I'm going to punish this man who wanted to punish my brother, to uh, my brother did not die. Therefore, he didn't, uh, Angelo didn't do the deed that he wanted to do. There's no point in punishing his intention, especially when there is a social reason to keep him alive, or you may say a dramatic reason to keep him alive so he can remain the spouse of Mariana. Uh, but but a, a, a certain kind of feminist reading, and this isn't by, these aren't by any means, they, it doesn't exhaust feminist reading any more than my snapshot of historicism exhausts historical reading, uh, but a certain kind of feminist reading really wants to look at Isabella as the key figure in the play, as a figure who is liberated into speech and into action and into agency, and whose refusal to be recaptured by some of these constraining social forms, uh, marriage here being, being analogous to the nunnery or the moated grange, rather than an escape from it for her, uh, might constitute the ultimate act of, of heroism or self-knowledge or defiance. That would be one kind of reading that the play would make available through that. Uh, 
there are and have been for many, many, many years Christian readings of this play. Uh, readings that, that look at, they say, well, look at the title, measure for measure. It comes from Matthew, judge not, be, that you be not judged. That this is really an allegory about, you know, God on earth. And God is in disguise, and he comes down, and he sees sinners, and he judges, and he forgives them. And uh, that this is that the Duke participates in this notion of the disguised God, uh, the figure who knows everything and allows, nonetheless, the foibles and sins of mankind to play themselves out uh, so that men, men and human beings, uh, will uh, perceive their own guiltiness uh, and will repent. Uh, and that God offers judgment, he offers mercy, he offers punishment, he offers his own uh, uh, humanity, his own embodied humanity uh, as an example here. And so the disguising of the all-powerful duke uh, as a friar who can be, be, be wrong, can be reviled, can be, be spat upon by Lucio, can be humiliated, uh, can be unmasked, uh, that this, this, this is Christian allegory. Uh, these arguments, I mean, this is again a, a, a kind of argument that is perfectly tenable within the, the structures of the play. Uh, it's an allegorical argument, which is to say that it, it, uh, it takes a certain distance, if you like, from some of the language of individual characters, but is completely consistent with the events of the play. I mean, and what I mean to suggest to you again is not that we're discarding these one by one because they're not good or we don't like them, but that they all like those, those images in your encyclopedia in which you see the body of the frog and then you see its bones and then you see its internal organs and so forth. That this is one layer upon another layer upon another layer upon another layer. That this, that, that this, this is the anatomy of the play. And that it's not, I mean, you could, you, you could choose one of these and reject others, or you could say, this one seems to me to bring out most and to, to get closest to the texture of the language or the emotions that the play seems to call out for me. But all of these things are completely consistent with, uh, you can do good readings of the play with any of these things in mind. As indeed, you can do a good, very powerful reading from the point of view of a kind of psychosexual or psychoanalytic not psychological, but psychoanalytic reading of the play. Now, what's the difference between psychology and psychoanalysis? Are there analysts in the room? Um, when, when I try to make a distinction between these two things, I'm, I, I'm making a very crude distinction between uh, motivations that seem to not be fully present in the minds of the, the, the characters or the actors, that their language or the, their behavior speaks for them in ways that seem contrary to what they think. So that Angelo, for example, uh, discovers, Angelo has this very uncomfortable moment in which he encounters his unconscious, in which he sees that uh, beneath the angel Angelo, and angel Angelo uh, will obviously participate in that Christian reading we talked about a second ago, that, that, that beneath the angel is a devil, that inside him is this, that, that once he starts to think in this vein, I have begun and now I give my sensual rain, race the rain, that he once, again, like Isabella, because he, he has little experience and little moderation, uh, unlike Aeschylus, the old counselor at the beginning of the play, for example, uh, he, whose name, again, not completely surprisingly remember, uh, resembles that of a classical playwright, uh, uh, Angelo is naive. He is psychologically virginal. He has no experience of these things, and so they hit him really hard. And he is unable to control the power of his own emotion and the power of his own desire. Uh, and so, I mean, you, it's like a cartoon what he does. That he, 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 she comes to him pleading for her brother's life, 
Uh, he confides to us that he finds her irresistible. And before the scene is over, he is basically saying to her, sleep with me, let me be very plain, sleep with me. First he puts it in the hypothetical. Supposing somebody were to ask you to do this, you know, if I asked you to the prom, would you go? Uh, and she says, well, gee, I don't really like proms. Well, no, no, let me be really plain about this. I am asking you to the prom, will you go? Uh, and, and so he, you know, all the pretense disappears. And what's left is, a, is an amazing proposition. It's a proposition much worse, of course, than the, than the, the Kate keep down financial world because there at least there is some apparent recompense. Here, what the, 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 the exchange is going to be the life of her brother. Does he mean it? No, it turns out that he has already delivered this note to the provost. No, the provost in this case means jailer, uh, uh, saying, no matter what else you hear, kill Claudio at a certain hour of the day. So he has, I mean, it's, n it's not as if he's meaning to keep this, this bargain with her. Uh, he's already decided that he's going to be both sides of this equation. He's going to keep this in the dark. And, uh, and she says, I will, uh, I will denounce you. I will, I will watch you, Angelo. I will unmask you, denounce you. I will expose you. What is she, it's, not, it's none of those things. Um, uh, it's important what the verb is. Um, I'll see if I can find it really quickly. Anyway, she, she, she says this to him, and he says, nobody will believe you. Who will believe you? I'm the figure of rectitude. Yes. I will proclaim you. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, and say, to, now that you found the word, say something about why, why it's a good word. I will proclaim you, Angela. So why is that better than all the ones that I was it's trying to think of? It's public, and it's an identity. It's, it's, it's public, it's, uh, it, it involves the law or some kind of performance. It is a performative word. It's a word that has, uh, that's not the same as I'm going to tell on you or I'm going to denounce you. It imagines a stage, a scene, a humiliation, a shaming, that his guilt is going to turn into shame. And uh, her, he, he says, who will believe thee, Isabel? Uh, I'm famous for my rectitude. You're just a girl. Nobody is, I'm very powerful. I'm the magistrate. I'm the person who makes the laws. I'm the law. Uh, mortality and mercy in Venice. Live in thy tongue and heart, is what the Duke says to him. So I'm the law. You can't, can't proclaim against the law. So uh, you know we don't have to go very far from this play to our daily newspapers to look at moments of sexual harassment in which is she, he said, she said, whether it's the, the New York Knicks or whether it's the return of uh, Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill, uh, these, these moments in which, which distinctions of power, I mean, look at, at Clarence Thomas. He is the, the law. He is the judge. He is precisely, uh, he, he, there's no one more powerful than, I mean, he, his, what is his title? He's supreme. And what, what, is, what is the name of the kind of figure that he is? He's not even a judge. What is it? He's a justice. He's the personification of justice. Uh, and uh, so here too, and uh, Angelo says, I'm the law. No one is going to believe you. No one's going to believe you. Uh, so he, the, the language, I mean, where the language that she thinks is going to be her aid, I will proclaim you, he says, nobody's going to believe it at all. Uh, so here we have these two extraordinarily repressed characters who perhaps because of their, you know, when I say because of, I, I'm not their analyst and I'm not their therapist. Uh, their repression has as its other side rhetorically in the play these moments of immoderation. Uh, he says, I have begun and now I give my sensual race the rein. She says, one second, she, she says, you know, whip me if I, if I should do such a thing. Uh, they betray themselves. Uh, over here, if you please. I am an analyst. It's called the return of the repressed. There you so. go. Of course, of course, absolutely. Uh, but what does it return from? I mean, it's it, it's it's uh, the thing about the return of the repressed is that, of course, it was always there. Right. And and this this is preeminently a play about disavowal in every possible, and it also is a play about displacement, uh, in which then that's that's actually why you got four pairs of lovers, because you could imagine this as one psychological relation. If this is couples therapy, one could imagine this as one psychological relation with all of these iterations. It's uh, purely sexual. It's rhetorical. It's, 
it's, it's self-denying. It, it fantasizes the power of the other. There are lots of different ways that one could imagine this. And, and this, is, this is very much how Shakespeare uses his stage to unpack things psychologically, psychoanalytically, by having uh, more than one. I mean, Hamlet is a perfect example of that, in which the, 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 the various relations of son to father uh, are iterated in Fortinbras and his fa father, in Hamlet and his father, and so forth. So in this play, whenever you have doubles or multiples, you have versions of the same. Uh, and, and precisely, they are so repressed. They're, moreover, they enjoy their repression. It's an eroticized repression, forgive me if I overstep here, but the, but, but the fact that she wants a more strict restraint is really a tip-off that there is, I mean, it's not a tip-off that she doesn't belong in a nunnery. It's a tip-off that if she's going to stay in this nunnery, that this is one of the uh, behaviors, attitudes, inclinations that she herself is going to have to disavow. Uh, and uh, the, the, uh, so these two characters are unbelievably eroticized in their language. Um, whoops. Um, I've got a few more minutes before I stop and, and change the tape. Uh, and, they, and they are present against the background of this city of Venice, of oh, sorry, Vienna, Venice, there you go. Um, uh, the, the city of, of Vienna, which as I say is and is not Freud's Vienna, in which uh, what seems to be the problem is rampant vice, is that laws have been let slip uh, and uh, the, the both, both sexual behavior and also uh, ordinary ethical behavior has, uh, has, 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 because, okay, let, let me put it this way. The Duke himself is supposed to have mastered these things. He, he is meant to be the kind of superego figure here who's supposed to be controlling things. He has not done it. And he feels that therefore he is not the right person. You could perfectly well say, well, sir, now that you see that your city has gone to hell, you're the right person to put it back into shape. And so, indeed, he is, but he sees that he has to do it by indirections, by, to use that language from Hamlet again, by indirections, find directions out, that rather than saying, I, I am your duke and I do love you, but I see that you really have to shape up, he, instead he sets up this test of Angelo, and he also sets up an arrangement whereby he, he will allow them to expose their own folly so that he can come in as savior. And this, if I can say this just briefly before we close for a moment, uh, this is also one of the behaviors that, that is described in any historicist reading of the play. Because James famously utilized his power over the people through threats and pardons that, that he would bring. There are a couple of occasions that they're, they're described, at, at least in beginning of, a, of a, a good edition like this, in which James has people brought to the scaffold and about to, to die, and then he pardons them. And it's the power of mercy that binds them to him. It's more powerful than the power of justice, that, he, that, that, that if he can forgive, that is the, because then, then you can always have that anticipation of forgiveness, of suspending the rules. And that's what this duke is able to do at the end of the play. We'll stop here, and we'll come back. Five minutes. Okay, so in, in this hour, we're going to try to make sure to look at a, some passages of text uh, to try to address, which, by which I do not mean answer, but, but respond variously to some questions that you may have and also maybe to look at a couple of scenes and how those scenes work. Let's see how much we can get done in this hour. Uh, let me mention just to conclude the discussion we've been having uh, in terms of lenses through which, critical lenses through which one might look at the play, that there are folkloric ways of looking at the play, that the bed trick, the head trick, the, the, the disdained wife, the, the, all the, the disguised ruler, that all of these things are old fairy tale stories, familiar stories, stories that have a resonance to them and that in their familiarity give us some expectation of how they're going to come out, which is again one of the things about the sort of undecided envy at, and, at ending in terms of, of, of what Isabella does or doesn't do with the Duke, uh, that would be a surprise in terms of our expectations uh, if she does not accept his hand. And, and so what we need to notice is that we actually have very little information about that. It's not enough to say 
it's a convention, therefore she must. Because Shakespeare is very capable of having women say, yes, I marry you, yes, I take you, yes, I love you. They happen, this happens very often at the ends of comedies and other plays. So if it doesn't happen here, it's not because he forgot to write it in, or maybe it is, but we have a, a, a more open-ended moment. Uh, and, and this leads me to the last of these big framing categories that I wanted to mention to you, which is, is this the, the category with which we began, that is to say, the category of, of genre. Is it a comedy? Is it a tragic comedy? Is it a so-called problem play? And I said to you the first time we were all together that this term problem play is a kind of modern term uh, that was really borrowed from criticism of Ibsen and Strindberg and Shaw and other late 19th century playwrights who were interested in, in plays having to do with social problems. Here it crosses over into another term that is often used these days and has been used by scholars and critics to describe plays like this, and that is city comedy. That There's a whole genre in Shakespeare's time of the city comedy, of the play that takes place uh, in London or in another city in which there are citizens rather than royals and nobles, in which there are there's prose, there's body joking, there's this question of women and money, uh, there's the question of fidelity and infidelity, of, of uh, uh, spendthrifts and du dupes and, and, and miserliness and so forth. There's a whole set of concerns around nascent capitalism, for example, which is what, where this is the time period in which this is happening, in which uh, the, the, the independent entrepreneur, the question of, of, of use value and exchange value of money, uh, the question of where value comes from and how value is related to wealth, of whether women are in fact dependents of men or whether they have not only agency but some capacity to make money. Are there any, any female entrepreneurs in this play at all? Any women uh, in business? Mistress Overdone, exactly. Mistress Overdone is the capitalist woman in this play. She is the woman who makes money. Uh, she's uh, Mistress Mitigation, as, they, as, as she is scornfully called. Uh, and she is that which has to be, I don't want to just call it repressed, uh, but she is that which has to be excluded, put in jail, put out of business, and we could say, well, yes, indeed, she's in the business of immorality, she's in the business of commodifying other women, uh, bad business, uh, but she is the only entrepreneur in the whole play. Uh, and the play uh, deliberately, I would say, and I shouldn't say that because I believe in intention in this way, but the, the, the play's architecture gives you a whole range of social categories and a whole range of, from, from the Duke, and the, 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 the magistrate, uh, and the old counselor, and the nuns, and the friars, and also uh, elbow the constable. Tell me something about elbow's language. Malapropisms, malapropisms. Now again, many low characters in Shakespeare, especially many uh, policemen in Shakespeare talk this way. Dogberry, in Much Ado About Nothing, speaks exactly this way. He speaks the opposite of what he intends. So he says that you know, his, his wife was never respected. By that he means disrespected. Uh, he, he uses precisely the opposite terms. And so his language is itself a kind of allegory for the world turned upside down, which is the world of this play. That, that, and they, again, they can laugh at him from a position of apparent superiority. And the audience can laugh at him and think that he gets everything backwards. Uh, but in fact, the getting everything backward tells a kind of uncanny truth about what's going on in this play. And the fact that he is talking about his wife and her respectability and whether she is respected or suspected. Suspected and respected become the two words that are exchanged here. And uh, you know, he's in the business of arresting suspects. And so he makes this kind of exchange. But the, the, on, on many, many levels, that, that is the anatomy of exchange of the play, of reversal of the play. And the play is, is in a way about these kinds of reversals. So city comedy would be another kind of genre for this play. Uh, does anybody in the play 
uh, I should put it slightly differently. Do any characters we encounter as characters in the play die in the course of the play? No. Now, we, we talked about Barnardine and the threat of the killing. Now, we, we have the, the, the tragic threat of the possible death of Claudio, uh, you know, appears in chains, uh, and who uh, Lucio says to him, from whence comes this restraint? And he says, from too much liberty, Lucio, liberty. So this, this dialectic of liberty and restraint that we see, we, I've been talking about in terms of, of um, uh, Angelo and uh, Isabella, also functions with Claudio. And actually, it is almost always the case, not only with sets of lovers or sets of women in Shakespeare, that, that brothers or brothers and sisters are versions of each other that there's a family resemblance between Claudio and Isabella uh, the, in, in the way in which they deal with these issues of restraint and liberty. She wants more restraint. He has behaved in a libertarian way. Uh, but in fact, they're versions of the same, and their behaviors are versions of the same. Uh, so that, that, that another way to get into this play, in a way that has been very fruitful for some critics, is to begin with a notion about a literary genre, whether it's comedy or tragic comedy or, or folktale or whatever it is, and then to see the degree to which the play obeys and resists some of our expectations about those genres. Uh, now, uh, many of us grew up with the notion of the literary convention that you know, a literary convention about Petrarchan love, for example, is that the, the, the lover is the servant of the mistress that the lady is on a pedestal. We saw this in Troilus and Cressida, where he was like a Petrarchan lover, the hero of a Petrarchan sonnet, uh, a sonnet whether written by Petrarch or by Sidney or by Shakespeare, in which the lady is idealized, and as in the case, for example, of Shakespeare's sonnets, splits into a good one and a bad one, that maybe she's, in fact, a, a figure of excess, of shame, of seduction. That's what happens to Cressida, too, that, that extraordinary moment in Troilus and Cressida, in which she says, this is and is not Cressid. The, imagine that the world is coming apart. So also here, because she is at the core of my belief, she, when she splits apart, into two in irreconcilable things. This is and is not Cressid. So also, my world, says Troilus, splits apart. It's very much like what happens in Shakespeare's sonnets uh, when he talks about two loves, loves have I of comfort and despair, or he talks about the, 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 the dark lady as a figure that, that drives him mad, and yet he can't help loving her, and so forth. Uh, any piece of literature, literary conventions are back formations. Critics talk about them as if they were already there. But no writer sits down, no good writer and no bad writer sits down and says, okay, here are the rules about a tragedy. It's got to have this and that. No right reader of Aristotle sat down and sort of said, ah, yes, where is the anonyurisis? Where is the moment of turn? I've got to have it now. Uh, these, the, the, these are deductive categories, and literary conventions are deductive categories. They are deduced by critics from reading many examples of something. Uh, Petrarch doesn't stop, start by saying, I've invented a category called the Petrarchan lover. Here are the 12 rules of it. So go off and write Petrarchan sonnets. Uh, and so here, if we say that, that the conventional end of a comedy is a marriage, or that these plays conventionally begin in apparent concord that masks a kind of discord, then they turn into full-blown discord, and then they, they return to a kind of resolution. Uh, Shakespeare does not have, I mean, maybe he does. Uh, we, uh, there have not survived any little guidebooks about how to write a play that begin with these rules. So that when we talk about rules, we're talking paradoxically about things that happen after and that are then codified as if they came before. Uh, so that it's completely fruitful to look at the conventions or expectations or normal practices within a genre, if the genre is pastoral or comedy or satire, and to say, how does this particular example both embody them and also resist them? Because it always will do both. I am now going to stop talking for a second. Uh, before we come to a passage or two, let, let's do what we didn't have a chance to do at all last time, and that is to hear some questions from you and try to use those as the basis for some discussion. Thanks. Um, 
In terms of uh, the play being a comedy or comic tragedy, I was struck by the scene where Isabella um, goes to her brother and tells him the, um, what the Duke had said. And he said, yes, you, you should um, do this for, for my life. Yes. And I thought there was an incredible betrayal, and right. there was nothing comic about it. Right. And I was sort of wondering um, what you thought or what other folks thought about that. So this is the scene, again, in which uh, <clears throat> Isabella has an expectation about what Claudio is going to do. Uh, and in fact, the scene itself is full of reversals. Let's, let's, it's a wonderful scene. Let's look at it. Um, yeah. Gosh, it's a great play. It's really hard to find. Um, so three one is. I, I was going to say as I'm passing through Act One and Two and Three, uh, I, I'm just pausing as I go. Uh, now, this, this is an amazing scene, again, because, um, uh, because of, the, of the degree to which they speak things that, uh, that are not in their conscious thoughts, that, that, that the, the degree, I mean, when Claudio says, if I must die, I will encounter darkness as a bride and hug it in mine arms, uh, at, to which her reply, and it's so symptomatic, is there spake my brother, there my father's grave did utter forth a voice. So she hears the father in the brother, and the, the, the memory of her father as a kind of figure of rectitude now dead uh, is throughout this play. He is, she wants him to be in the paternal position uh, with respect to her. Uh, but, but it's a scene that's full of turns. Uh, because she expects that, of course, he is going to say, you couldn't possibly do that. And he does, initially. He says, uh, I, uh, uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, oh, heavens, it cannot be. Uh, thou shalt not do it. Thanks, dear Isabel. Um, and then in the middle of a sentence, about line 112, uh, well, a little earlier, sure it is no sin, or of the deadly seven it is the least. Which is the least, says it. She thinks she's clinched this deal. She's off the hook. She doesn't have to even wrestle with her conscience because her brother doesn't want her to do it. Uh, sure it is no sin, one of the or of the deadly sins. Which is the least? She says, this is, she's leaving the stage. Which is the least? Wait a second. If it were damnable, he being so wise, why would he for the momentary trick be perdurably fined? Oh, Isabel. Now here, here he's unable to keep, keep to his resolve. What says my brother? Death is a fearful thing. And here you have this extraordinary passage from him, this absolutely amazing passage. I but to die and go we know not where, to live in cold obstruction and to rot, this sensible warm motion to become a kneaded clod and the delighted spirit to bathe in fiery floods, or to reside in thrilling region of thick ribbed ice, to be imprisoned in the viewless winds and blown with restless violent violence round about the pendant world, the hanging world, or to be worse than worst of those that lawless and uncertain thought imagine howling, tis too horrible, the weariest and most loathed worldly life that age, ache, penury, and imprisonment can lay on nature is a paradise to what we fear of death. So he looks death in the face here, just as he has, you know, he was counseled by the friar to be absolute for death. But this is the moment when he looks death in the face, and he looks at it through all of these, uh, the, the story of Dante, with the you know, worst of, of hell is actually ice, the story of the viewless winds here. Uh, uh, and, and the bringing together of paradise with his vision of hell, uh, uh, also imagining himself being unable to imagine. That's, that's the, the, the uncanny, astonishing quality of this. I but to die and go we know not where, to lie in cold obstruction and to rot this sensible warm motion to become a kneaded clod. Yes? Um, that when you're talking about feminism, this passage... Um, reminds me of Juliet's meditation on death before she takes the poison. I mean, she, and she, 
she's very specific about how horrible it is, but then she, she does it. Right? right, right. Now, she also looks death in the eye, absolutely. And there are several different, I mean, the, 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 Romeo also has a moment in which he, he uh, f uh, physically imagines what, what it's like to die. Yes? Well, I found this the most troubling relationship. I really didn't care whether she married the Duke or not. I never, but I thought this because it seemed so unresolved, these difficult questions that none Which, of us... The, the, between the, this, in this particular scene? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Between brother and sister, they were, right. that he uses that to bring up such troubling, impossible questions, which are never resolved, and and I thought that relationship was was never. Uh, I just couldn't. Yeah. I didn't get it. <laughs> well, I'm with you up to the not getting it. But what what would you like to get? Well, I wondered what would they be willing to do for each other. Well, why should they do anything for each other? Well, because they love each other. I thought. <laughs> and, and is, I thought there was a powerful bond, a powerful well, love between these two, something I never thought existed in any of the other relationships. So, but is, you know, no, I'm, and I agree with you, and you can tell that I agree with you, because in, in my chapter I talk a lot about the fact that at the end of the play, the, the, the reunion is between the brother and the sister, that Juliet is really not so much a part of it, and that the Duke's double, yeah, double proposal silly, you know, the seems Duke. to me to be missed by, by mm -hmm. Isabella because she's focused on on Claudia, but look what she says. Is it not a kind of incest to take life from thine own sister's shame? That, that, that the, the idea of incest rises to the surface here. The idea of an erotic relation, but a fulfilled erotic relation between the two of them rises to the incest, to, to, to the surface here, and becomes a kind of taboo. Is it not a kind of incest to take life from thine own sister's shame? How, how would you explicate that line for me? What does it mean? just has problems with sex. Well, no, no, but that's, that's not what the sentence means. That could be a, that, that could. Why, why does she what, use do, that do term? Is it not a kind of incest to take life from thine own sister's shame? What it, just do me a paraphrase or an interpretation of it. It seems like uh, uh, Isabel has to commit a sexual act to save Claudio's life. Um, so that Claudio gains his life through her her sexual submission. Uh, so why is it incest? Back there. That he's actually a participant in the act. That he takes part in a way by receiving the benefit of the act. So because, because why? Because, because his life actually comes out of this current Correct. experience. Is that right? Right. It's, it's his act almost as much as hers. He's the, the proximate cause of the act. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything more about this? He is, in effect, reborn through the act. Yes. I think that that's crucial, that, that, that his... Uh, to take life here means not only to keep it, but as if, as if the, 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 the coupling that she's sent off to do will produce him as, as a new child, as a, as a reborn child. That, that there's, there's this sense in which she gives birth to him again. That's not incest, though. I mean, the act of incest is, is a sexual relationship between, in this case, brother and sister. The brother being reborn as a result of the sister's sexual act is, is not, is that incest? Look at, look at her line, what does she say? Does she say, is it not incest? She says, is it not a kind of incest? That is to say, she is stretching the term. So as to talk about something that isn't quite literal incest, but that partakes of that over intimacy, it's sexual. They're not having sex with one another, but as as other people have said, their their sexualities are here so interimbricated and will produce this result that it is a kind of incest. Is it not a kind of incest? Um, now, this is again the playwright who just wrote Hamlet, who is interest in, interested in these, these the questions of kinds of incest. You may know that one of the big debates uh, about about. Henry VIII 
was whether, uh, I mean, his, his, his first divorce of, of Catherine of Aragon, uh, he claimed was because he had unwittingly committed incest by, by marrying his, his brother's widow. Uh, and another kind of incest, and that that was why his offspring were cursed. That is to say, he didn't have any male offspring. So the kinds of incest are very much sort of being discussed here. It's not only, as you might think, in the 20th, 21st century, a parent and a child have sex together, or a brother and sister have sex together. But remember that parent-child is also here, incest, as well as brother-sister. I guess I responded a lot here to the idea of um, the hatefulness, in, in, you know, that was involved in their relationship, and that somehow or other, I so uh, the question came to me. But what if she were asked to donate an organ or to give a bone marrow transplant mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to save him? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, is that a kind of incest, or do you know? Well, um, I don't know. Uh, I, I, the issue itself doesn't quite wrong. I mean, the, the, uh, the degree to which this play functions like a logic or like a fairy tale is that everybody is asked to do the thing that they want least to do, or the thing about which they have a certain kind of resistance. So if she were asked to go get money, not a problem. She would go with her begging bowl and she would go get money because she's not, she's not defended against that. She is asked to do the one thing that she can't do. It's not, so it's not about him. It's about a resistance in her. He is, the, he is the flashpoint of her encountering a resistance in herself. Uh, and uh, it's that that has to be overcome. It's not about whether she really loves her brother or not. It's that's it, it's and or how she loves her brother because indeed this incest theme, as I say, really does come back in. I think in the staging of the play, at the end, in which the the the, the reunion seems to be the rebirth of Claudio. We do have precisely a rebirth of Claudio. He is in Fons, not speaking. He's a child. He's muffled. He unmuffles himself, and he is reborn. So he is reborn, uh, and he's reborn to her. But it's really about her resistances. And as in some you know, horrible magic world, uh, it's only the specific punishment for yourself. Or as in Dante, you're in the circle of hell that is designed around your own sin. You're in the situation which is your own blockage. Because it's really your interior world that is extrapolated here. There are any number of things that she could do for him that would cost her nothing because they're on her list of okay for Isabella to do. She's precisely asked to do the one thing that she can't do, or that she feels that she can't do. Otherwise, there'd be no test. Yeah. Thanks. I guess also going along with, with the Freudian interpretation, if indeed there were an incestuous um, bond between them, then she definitely wouldn't want him okaying her sleeping with somebody else. Right. Right. Absolutely. She, she, uh, precisely. Yeah, good. Um, yeah. Is there anything to the fact that she's given her, that she's made a vow, that she's keeping a promise, and that he's asking her to break the promise? Well, you mean the, the promise in the novitiate? Yeah. Well, so it's, but that's, she hasn't done the, it yet. that's why it's important that she's just a novice, that she hasn't taken her final vows. Because if she had taken her final vows, A, it would be. But, but of course, this is a play about broken promises. This is a play about, about the range of promising. This is why a speech act reading of this play is actually very interesting, because a, 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 a promise is a principal kind of performative speech act. I marry you, or I will give you this, or I will rescue you. Uh, Angelo uh, breaks his promise twice. He breaks his promise to Mariana. He breaks his promise to Isabella. He has no intention of fulfilling the bargain of producing Claudio alive. He's already sent the message against himself. Um, and, and if I can just pursue this for one more second, uh, in that moment, there are two Angelos. There's the Angelo who is the letter of the law as encountered as in the letter that he sends saying, never mind what else you hear, kill him. And the, there's the Angelo who is the animated spirit who resists against this and who is unable to reduce himself or expand himself to that law. And he too, encounters the only devil that is, and we'll see this in Othello next week, we'll see that 
that there are millions of things that would not get to us. Othello is, has no difficulty with armies or with deserts or with thirst or with the, the, any suffering in the world he can do. What he can't stand is erotic jealousy and, 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 and the sense of, of lack of self-worth. It's the one thing that in, in this otherwise impermeable surface of this very admirable man that he cannot tolerate. So it's the one thing that his tempter gets at him for. And that's what, that's what happens here. Yes? <laughs> I'm curious about, because we know so much about the two characters who, end up, who are presumably going to end up in the end, Isabella and the Duke, I was under the impression that by the end, from knowing so much about the two of them, that she would not want to be with him. And the reason why is it's kind of glossed over as you're reading, but no one really ever says anything about the fact that this guy has been impersonating a religious figure throughout the entire play, and the fact that he's in these, in these very immoral situations where he's telling people that so-and-so's dead. and they're, um, It's like that experiment where, where they had the people pressing the buttons and thinking they were shocking somebody in the other room. Yeah, Is it moral experiment. to be yeah. doing that, to be uh -huh. giving people their death rights? And I thought in the end, I was like, she'd probably be repulsed by this guy for standing in as someone. I just didn't know what you thought about that. Well, okay, so here we have two things. We have your projection on Is Isabella, that she should think as you do about him, uh, with, without any evidence of, I mean, she doesn't say that. You, you have said it. So I, I want to separate the, what, what, what we might think that Isabella, if we were actresses, that we performing Isabella might have in mind. And just go back to your judgment on the Duke and see how other people feel about that, because you have given us evidence from the play uh, about his behavior, though not yet about her response. You, I mean, you're, you, you're, you've extrapolated a response based upon your own response to him. But let's talk about, about your response to him and how people feel about, about I mean, he, he's, a, he's a liar and a cheat and a blasphemer. I have a question for you. So my question is, uh, the Duke stands for liberty, but in the same time, Claudius, uh, Isabella's brother, stands for liberty. Definitely Isabella loves her brother. Why shouldn't her love the Duke? Well, I think the point here is that the Duke uh, impersonates, lies, counterfeits. I mean, this, this language of, of impersonation and counterfeiting is all over the play. It's part, again, of its mercantile structure, this idea of, of counterfeiting and of money. Uh, but the question of impersonation is very much an issue for the play, of pretending to be that which you are not. Uh, the word person comes from the, which, we, you know, it, in a libertarian sense, in a Lockean sense, that you, know, you own your person, your personal property, comes from the word for mask, persona, which means not you. So that a person is already an impersonation. And an actor uh, putting on a persona is an impersonation of an impersonation. So by this logic, and this is Hamlet's logic, only an actor speaks the truth because only an actor knows he acts, whereas other people actually think they have essence and are mistaken in thinking that there is a coincidence between their inside and their outside. Notice the prevalence in this play of the word seeming. Seeming, seeming, I, 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 I have you, Angelo, for seeming. Uh, this, the the non-coincidence coincidence of the inside and the outside. Uh, now the Duke, makes this into an operating principle. Uh, but the, bear in mind that he is never undetected by us, that we see his withdrawal, we see the plan, we see the costume, we see uh, him say to us every once in a while, I'm going to, sorry, provost, I've got to leave for a little while. I'll be back because he doesn't want to be there when Isabella comes and so forth. That everything about his stage managing, which is maybe a better word than playwriting here, is on the surface for us. So he's not lying to us. Is there any moment in the play? Yes. Is he stage, sorry. Is he stage managing the moment when he chooses not to tell Isabella ah. that um, Claudio yeah. is alive? But well, that is the, the moment where you think to yourself, were 17th century people different from us? I mean, what does it mean to know that her brother is alive and to 
to test her further by saying, uh, get over it, you really have to, sorry, we were too late and the, the beheading did take place and so uh, sorry, he's dead. Um, uh, what, what kind of motivation, you know, he, what, what, is, what, is he, what does he offer as his motivation? What does he say his motivation is? She'll be all that much happier when she discovers that he's really alive. It's um, the moment when she stops banging her head against the wall. Right, right. And again, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not an answer to say that that logic is used by other characters in other plays of Shakespeare, but it is. We'll see when we come to um, Cymbeline that Jupiter does the same thing, and he says the reason I test him is to make the, this, this thing the more delayed, delighted, that the longer you have to suffer, the gladder you're going to be. Uh, and there, there are other characters between here and there who do the same thing. Yes, please. But, I mean, this is just like him playing God, like, oh, this is what she would want. And that's right. the part that re makes me repulse him the most, is that he feels like he has the, like, the intelligence and the power to be in that kind of position, to make right. those kind of decisions. Uh, many readers and critics have felt, as you do, about his self-importance and his controlling uh, they haven't, these, such critics have not always also said, as you said, he's impersonating a religious figure and so that's a bad thing on his. I mean, these are two different discourses that, that could cross over but need not necessarily cross over. But something about his, his the smugness with which he, he undertakes this, this, these controlling activities, have made, it made some people admire him and some people uh, see through, feel that they see through him and that precisely this is exactly the kind of guy that that they don't admire. Yeah. Just say one more thing. Sure. Um, there's something very specific that that I wanted to point out, and it's doesn't when he's talking to Lucio, Lu, Lucio, and he thinks Lucio thinks he's a friar. Yes. And he admits to him that he's had this relationship with a woman, but if he were a real friar, telling him that isn't that supposed to be held confidential? Mm -hmm. And this is just like a total betrayal of of everything that's supposed to be sacred about religion. I, I, we have to gain our notion of the rules of this world from the text of the play. Uh, there are in Chaucer uh, religious figures who have sexual relations. Are you, yes. I'm no. dying to jump in on this. Please. Do you mind? I, I, I have to, um, I want to build upon what she's saying because it is in the text. I think that um, the reason that we feel him to be particularly creepy and perverted beyond many of the characters who we're just supposed to take um, as a matter, we suspend our judgment, our, dis our, our disbelief, because we know that there is this stock character who dresses up like a friar and then runs around in the play and machinates and, and um, gains what information he can. But it is specifically the moments in which he is... Um, performing a sacrament of the religion. It's at the moment when he's supposed to be um, keeping uh, Claudio from despair. One of the prime um, functions that any cleric can perform is you know, um, coaching someone who's about to go into the great beyond to gain God's grace, but instead he's using it as a manipulation to push him to the utmost to really put him into psychological despair. It's at the moment when he's supposed to be acting as a confessor that he's trying to extrapolate more information out of people. And I do think that that would have been something that, um, I, I think it's something that's particularly queasy to us, whether or not we agree or, um, you know, we ourselves have particular faith in those sacraments. They, it's, well, let's, let's put this, this scene next to the Barnardine scene in which he imagines himself to be in the same position. Remember all these situations that we have in Shakespeare where there's a, there's a scene and then there's another version of the same scene that, 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 that casts the first one into a slightly different light. So the two messages of the nurse to Juliet and, and the, uh, the two proposals of Richard III to women, one of whom accepts him and one of whom rejects him. So here we have the Duke attempting to shrive somebody twice. The first time you have this long encounter with Claudio in which he says be absolute for death and you have to look into yourself and so forth. Second one is the Barnardine scene in which Barnardine says, I'm sorry, I'm drunk. I'm in no situation to be, have my, my, my soul examined. Uh, I'll certainly go to hell if you kill me today, so I'm not playing. You know, I, 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 if you look for me, find me in my ward. 
Try, try me tomorrow. This is not a good day for me to die. Uh, and the, the two scenes are dramatically set up to function, I think, in this contrapuntal way. Uh, indeed, it's creepy. It is creepy. Uh, it's, uh, let's try to think about, I don't know the answer to this, but let's try to ask the question, what does it achieve for Claudio? What is the, 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 never mind how, what a bad cleric he is. Uh, what, is, what, what happens what, in the relationship between the Duke and Claudio? What is achieved by this torture? Is, is uh, what the Duke's trying to achieve is uh, Claudio's penance through this psychological suffering, and that he really puts him, takes him right to, to the edge of death so, so that he can purify himself in some way through his suffering or through well, his anxiety. And is anxiety. this just controlling, I mean, everyone wondered with his blasphemous, but is this just controlling behavior that he wants to watch this guy uh, expose himself so that he can deal with the uh, raw feelings that this man has? Or, I mean... I don't know. I, what, if one, one defense you might make of the Duke is that he's, that he's trying to uh, uh, help Claudio suffer through this thing and be a better man at the end of it, but I'm not sure I buy that. Yeah. Well, I wonder if the contrast in the way Bernardino, what his name is, uh, received the information is Bernardino. so... Bernardine? Yeah. Bernardine. Received the information. It's so entirely different. Uh, he seemed to make fun of this person who was not going to let him tell him how to die. And right. It, right. And so it was in contrast with Claudio. Well, they, and, and, they are very contrasted, of course. And I think making fun then of this priest in his power, or friar in his power. So, well, I'll tell you, so, I'll tell so you if what I can to do pick up that. on that a little bit, so what you're seeing, and this is this happens in in the Richard III example, it happens in the, in the nurse example. What you're seeing is a loss of power on the part of this figure who began as being very powerful. What you see is that the, you thought the Duke could do this, but in fact, in another circumstance, he didn't. And what happens toward the end of the play is that really he does lose control. He, we it, at, before the play, we learn that he abdicated control. When he's in disguise, he mobilizes a certain degree of control, but he overshoots in a way. And his, the, his, his, his attempt to manipulate, in fact, is, uh, is easy to reject. If you, if you don't have what Claudio has, which is self-reflection. I mean, the thing about Barnardine is that, that, that he, he's not interested in interrogating his own feelings. And he's not, he doesn't have these extraordinary passages of poetry inside him about the imagination of death. Um, yeah, Larry. Uh, but but the, to dislike the Duke or to feel that the Duke, and to feel that the Duke gets his comeuppance uh, is, uh, is one of the principal, I mean, there, there have been pro-Duke and anti-Duke readings of this play. The pro-Duke readings move to the allegorical level very quickly. They say, aha, it's God on earth or it's a playwright, or so, so that the things that we're describing as inhumane or uh, against a certain social or religious code are explained away or excused by the fact that it isn't really a person. It's really a function of some kind, whether it's a, 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 a theological function or whether it's a playwright function or it's, it's something so, so that the, the, the human interaction drops away in that kind of reading. And it's not sort of why would he do that to somebody, but any more than you'd say, well, why does Red Cross run into despair in book one of the Fairy Queen? It's, it, it's, it's an allegory, and so it functions on the level of an allegory, and some readings do that. Uh, uh, so to go back to your question about sort of whether we should, on the basis of our evaluation of the Duke, anticipate that Isabella, who doesn't seem to have very many opinions about him one way or the other, and doesn't know a lot about these. I mean, she does know about the Mariana plot, and she agrees in it to it, although she doesn't like the lot. She doesn't like the lot. She's still a good girl, doesn't like the lot. Um, but we don't have a lot of information about how she might respond toward him. What we do have is the information that she doesn't respond. And that in, is in its own way another sign of the failure of his power. If she said no to him, that would, that would have a different, different function than if she, 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 had, she made no response to him, whatever. 
Let's take one more question and then look at one of these passages. Or response or commentary. Let's look for, okay, instead of, instead of questions, let's do a division of the house. Um, how many people, um, uh, <clears throat> pick one of the following characters. The Duke, Claudio, Isabella, um, or Angela and uh, rank them in your own minds in terms of whether you admire them, okay? Uh, so how many admire the Duke most? Isabella, most. Claudio, most. Angela, most. Okay. Uh, so no one admires the Duke. Everyone is resistant to the Duke. Is that right? Yeah. Well, somehow I do like him, <laughs> but it's just somehow. Uh, he seems like a god in this play, and um, he seems to know exactly what will happen and everything about every, every single character. Right. Uh, and somehow this fits uh, his position because he's the Duke and he's supposed to know everything about his, uh, uh, his people. Right. But he's delegating the power to Angelo in order, maybe in order to verify how the things really are. Right. Or maybe in order to change the things in a way he couldn't have done as a duke. Right. As a duke. So I admire him because he is a, to me, he was able to, to change the things um, and um, I think that uh, in the end, this is not necessarily written in the in the text of the play. It's just my opinion, so it's not so important. I think in the play, in the in the end, Isabella is saying yes, just because uh, he's the duke. He's the one who has. Um, it's not written in the play. Uh, he you has. Think she will say yes. I think she will uh -huh. will say yes uh -huh. because uh, he has the uh, the power. And uh, she's not saying no. Well, okay. So, so that's so the. Uh, I just I want to pick up on one thing that you said about his. You know, he looks at the world. He sees this in disarray. He uses Angelo as, as, and he know, every, understands everything. It is really true. Except this is the Barnardine effect. This is the one thing he doesn't know. Uh, this is the the. Uh, he knows about Mariana. He knows about the the, the various dowries. He knows. Uh, what a bad guy Angelo is, he deliberately puts him up so as to fall and so forth. He, but, but there's one thing outside the control of the Duke, and that is the, and, and, it, and it's interesting that it manifests itself in this play as comedy. The one thing that he cannot control is the comic, the eruption of comedy. And comedy always lives. So that, that, that figures who are doomed to die, who are comic like Falstaff, you know, he, he, he seems to die on the stage and then he rises up again. Uh, that, that there's, there's, there's always something outside of this, this circle. Uh, I'm going to turn us to a passage because I promised that we would. Um, and let's, so you have this piece of paper. Uh, and let's look at the first one first. Let's see what we, how far we can go. So Angela is speaking to Isabella in Act 2, Scene 2. The law hath not been dead, though it hath slept. Those many had not dared to do that evil if the first that did the edict, the, the, the did the edict infringe and answered for his deed. Now tis awake, takes note of what is done, and like a prophet looks in a glass that shows what future evils, either raw or by remissness new conceived and so in progress to be hatched and born, are now to have no successive degrees, but ere they live to end. Now this is tough. Let's analyze it. What's it about? Yes. The deterrent effect of uh, strictly enforcing the law. In other words, if you strictly enforce the law, it will deter others before they uh, commit the offenses. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, that's, I think it's a good solid paraphrase of this. 
what, uh, what does the language that we see in front of us do to complicate that? It's the personification of law. Ah, okay. Okay. What, person, what, 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 what evidence do you see of personification? Well, the law hath been dead. So you're giving human qualities to an abstract notion. Now the law is awake. Um, so it's almost like Angelo's uh, saying, it's not really about me. It's about the law. So the, lo the, the law is personified. The mm -hmm. law seems to have been dead, now is alive, uh, what else does it do? Mm, well, the law is like a prophet, it's like a person, mm -hmm. it's like a prophet who mm -hmm. can see evil uh, mm -hmm. as it's hatching and, mm -hmm. uh, and stop it before mm -hmm. uh, it, it grows. What is uh, meant by glass, looks in a glass? Uh, isn't that meant like a prophetic mirror or yeah, something? It's, yes, yeah. it's both of these things. I mean, the, in, in the period, there are glass means mirror, uh, but glass also is precisely this kind of prophetic magic you know, crystal ball, we would say, uh, that we'll see one of these shows up in Macbeth, that uh, it's, and the idea is that it shows you the future. Uh, so that the, the, the glass both shows you yourself and also shows you the future. Uh, and, and that's part of the force of how it, how it functions here. Uh, and of course, it's also brittle and can break. What else? What is the last? Yes, please. Sin also seems to be personified here as in, in a rather unattractive way, um, being described as either raw or in progress to be hatched mm -hmm. and born, personified or, or, or as some sort of creature, an animal, or coming out of an egg. And there seems to be some sort of like abortion-esque imagery about things being stillborn, things being stopped before they hatch. Well, is it before they hatch? Or is it that they hatch in order to die? And so in progress to be hatched and born or now to have no successive degrees, but ere they live to end. So is it before or is it after? I Who's thought it was. Is this? Yeah. This is you. Yeah, I agree with her very much that it is abortive. I mean, it's both things. It's either going to be brought all the way to term <clears throat> and then dead immediately after, or even almost better yet, that it, it'll be killed in the womb, so to speak, before, you know, in the conception, in the imagination, wherever it is that it's half hatched, it'll be s strangled there. <coughs> Excuse me, this word conception, <coughs> <Excuse me. coughs> which is not in the passage, but that underpins the passage, has that double meaning of uh, imagination. And so it's, it's above and below. It's like the head trick, which is both above and below. So in a play which is about an illegitimate pregnancy and which is surrounded by these images like that very unaccustomed Lucio speech about your, your brother and his lover have embraced and so forth, how does this speech about stillbornness or abortion or things that, that are conceived in order to die before they come to fruition. How does this speech function vis-a-vis -vis those other, even even vis-a-vis -vis the fact that there's a pregnant woman in the play? Like the, the law stands in opposition to life. <coughs> it's like the law stands in opposition to life. Uh, says who? Uh, that, that would be my interpretation. Well, that would be your interpretation of Who's saying what? Oh, I, that's the way Angelo of sees. Of Angelo's, of what Angelo says. Yeah, right. About the law. Uh, of Angelo's law, of Angelo's imagination right. of the law here. Uh, what does it tell us about Angelo? It doesn't tell us anything about the law. It only tells us something about Angelo. It uh, gives a, an impression of the meanness of his ideas uh, about the law and of uh, how it is uh, to be affected. And why do you say meanness? Uh, because the, uh, well, first of all, the, the language that he uses, it's obvious that he, he, he is talking about, you know, there are evil thoughts, but if you have this strict interpretation of the law, it's gonna, it's gonna cut them all short. Uh, 
Right. And, uh, but he takes a relish in just the way he describes what those evil thoughts are. Let's go back to the context of the speech for a second, okay? Do you have your texts with you? Can you look at Act 2, Scene 2? Because the, something of the dramatic irony of this speech is lost when we look at it out of context. Uh, here's the dramatic situation. Isabella and Angelo are having a conversation. Why are they having a conversation? She's come to plead for her brother's life. And in order to do that, what argument does she have to make to him? Yeah, please. She has to make him care about... She has to make him care about, about human life and not so much about being so concrete with what the law is. Well, she, I mean, she, indeed, she wants mercy rather than justice, but, but what, what, is, what is her claim about what Claudio has done? Um, uh, nothing. Just look at the passage. Oh. Exactly. Exactly. It's sort of, I mean, her rhetorical position as the lawyer coming in to talk to Angela, pleading the case before the judge, is to say, it's okay. Premarital sex is okay. Sex is okay. It's a good thing. It's not, you know, just human. Uh, she didn't believe a word of this. This is not her view. This is, this is, this, this is, this is, and, and we've got, how do we know this? We know this partly because Lucio is standing there saying, well said, that's well said, that's well said. Uh, the, the, uh, the scenario is that she has got to maintain an argument to him that does not, in fact, reflect her own beliefs at all, necessarily. Uh, that they are both speaking in a way lines that they need to perform. That, that she, indeed she believes that life is better than death. Indeed that she believes that mercy is better than justice. She does believe those things. But what she has to persuade him of, uh, Angelo of, is an attitude of, about, of, of permissiveness about this particular law against sex that does not necessarily reflect her own attitude toward it at all. She's been put in this position of advocate for her brother's behavior. And what's, what's, what's astonishing about the way the scene unfolds and what's so interesting about this moment, because it's in response to this whole question about should he die for having impregnated his almost wife, that we get this speech that describes uh, the, the, uh, the law and what it will bring forward in exactly this, this set of, of abortive images. Um, yes? Is the law, though, a projection of himself and his own fright? Uh, if he were to be, you know, he's trying to seduce her, and is it his fright about being alive? I mean, does he see himself as the law? Well, he, we don't yet know that. We've, we've, we, um, uh, at this point, point, what we have from her is show some pity, I show it most of all when I show justice, that great Shakespearean dyad of mercy and justice and so forth. She, then we hear from her, he says, be, be, you know, accept the fact your brother's going to die, he dies tomorrow, be content. Uh, we get from her a, a, a wonderful line, uh, it's excellent to have a giant strength, but it's tyrannous to use it like a, a giant. It's, it's actual, and, 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 but man, proud man, dressed in a little brief authority, most ignorant of what he's most assured, his glassy essence, and there's that glass again, does it reflect or does it predict? Like an angry ape, plays such fantastic tricks before high heaven as makes the angels weep. But we don't really have the full force of his own eroticism until a little bit later on. She speaks, my natural guiltiness, what's this, the tempter tempted, and so forth. The, he, he begins to speak to himself and to us increasingly as in it. And again, it's, her, it's partly her resistance and the ardor that she's showing towards something else, toward her brother, that is part of what, it's as if she's flushed, she's, you know, you're beautiful when you're angry. I mean, there's something about her, her, her demeanor in this moment when she really is not interested in him at all. She's interested in trying to make her case that is amazingly attractive to him and that she speaks back to him. I mean, imagine King Lear finding Cordelia appealing if she spoke back rather than, than angry uh, when she spoke back. 
but but it's it. I mean, this so that the this this image that we began with comes in the context of a whole discourse about physical pregnancy and bringing forth children and whether fornication is itself a, uh, a venial sin or human nature uh, and something that a human being, because in fact, what, what do we know about Angelo uh, in, in reputation? Uh, do, do, is he described at all as a sort of non-human being? He's, he's ice, yes, he's, he's, his blood is congealed ice, uh, when his urine is ice, the, I mean, all of his fluids are ice. So that, and remember that passage that we looked at before, in which Claudio imagined death as a hellish world of ice. In a way, Angelo, the angel, is already living, in, at least in these people's view, in that, that, that hell, that, that place beyond emotion, that place where, where uh, there are no feelings. Where, 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 where one is a needed clod, where one has no emotions at all. Uh, and, uh, and so this, this, this paragraph that we're looking at uh, is, is Angelo on pregnancy, so to speak. This is Angelo on this same thematic. Uh, why like a prophet? Oh, look at the time, I'm so sorry. I shouldn't keep you beyond your hour, and they're waiting out there. We'll, we'll, we'll have to pick up on profits next time. It, it's Othello next time, is that right? Is it? OK. Um, so keep your eye on sexual jealousy. <laughs> <laughs>